So for the last two weeks, we've been studying the book of Philippians. And the theme of our Bible study has been Rejoice Always, because Philippians is a little book that's all about joy. About how we can have joy in Jesus no matter what the situation is. Like usual, we want to review a couple things that we talked about in the past, just to keep them on our minds. So first of all, joy in chains. That's what we heard last time. We heard the Apostle Paul say that he rejoiced even though he was in chains. And Paul gave two big ways in which his chains actually helped spread the gospel. Which isn't what we expect, because we expect, well, if a Christian gets put in chains, that's the end. This is a bad thing. Nothing good's going to come out of this. Paul said there were two ways that him being chained up actually helped spread the gospel. Somebody remember what one of those ways was? He had a captive audience. Yeah. Yeah. When he went into the prisoners, but the guards. And then when he was in the house, the rest, he had the captive audience of the guards. Excellent. So we read from the book of Acts that it seems like Paul's chains, he's not in like a dungeon or a prison, but he's, he's, he's under house arrest. So he can't leave a house. And he's chained up there to a soldier, but at least he's not chained up in stocks in the prison or something like that. And so one way that his chains helped spread the gospel was that every single Roman soldier who was chained to the Apostle Paul, what did every Roman soldier get to hear? The gospel. Over and over and over again. And Paul makes a point to mention that everyone in the palace guard, and we don't understand exactly how this system worked, but it seems like the people who were guarding Paul were directly connected with the emperor. And so not only was he sharing the gospel with your average Roman soldier, but he's sharing the gospel with people who are also spending time with the emperor himself. And so Paul's chains are helping to advance the gospel. Do you remember the second way? There was a second way that Paul being chained up actually was helping more people hear about Jesus. Exactly. Paul being chained up encouraged the other Christians to share their faith too. And as people heard, you know, Paul's in jail, but he's not losing hope. In fact, he's continuing to share the gospel. In fact, more and more people are hearing that encouraged other Christians. Just like today, when we hear about Christians standing up for their faith in difficult situations, that encourages us too. They say, well, this is real. This is true. God can give me that strength too. And so, Paul's chains helped all those Roman soldiers hear the gospel and encouraged Christians out other places to share the gospel too. Another big thing that I want us to remember is how Paul talks about a win-win situation when you're a Christian. In your study sheet, I've got a blank there. It says, write out the words of Philippians 1 verse 21, which means you're supposed to have those memorized. <laughs> So, excellent for me to live is Christ and to die is gain that's not too hard to remember right? right write that down and then try to memorize that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain and so as Paul looks at his life even as he's chained up even in a pretty difficult situation he says Life is a win-win situation. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Alright, in what way? What's the blessing of continuing to live? So we get to spread the word of the gospel. What else? Why is it a good thing to be alive? We have Jesus. Jesus is with us. Jesus is our example. Jesus forgives us and empowers us. Right? Every day that you're alive, it's because Jesus wants you to be alive. And it's because Jesus is with you and Jesus has a plan for you, for me to live, is Christ. What if, and now I'm not talking about any of us here, but what if one day you grow old? Okay, and you get older and you find that you can't do all the things that you used to do. And this isn't any of you. Right? But just we're thinking about the future. What if you get old one day? Is it still a good thing to be alive? 
Yes, every day that you're alive to live is Christ. That's a blessing. But then Paul adds, to die is gain. In other words, to die is even better. Right? It's a good thing to be alive, but when I die, I'm going to gain even more. Why does he say that? Because we'll be with Jesus in heaven. Because we'll be with Jesus in heaven. And so this is meant to give a Christian confidence. No matter what happens, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Last week, we heard Psalm 23 in our worship service. And Psalm 23 ends with a similar thought. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If I'm alive, God's goodness and love is going to go with me. Doesn't mean life's going to be easy. There's going to be struggles and difficulties, but God's goodness and love will be with me. That's good. And then one day, I'm going to live in God's house forever. That's a good thing too. This is what gives Christians confidence. It's a win-win situation. Karen? There is a saying that says, I drink from my saucer because my cup overfloweth. And I think of that. That's right. I've never heard that before. That has to do with Psalm 23 also. Karen says there's a saying that I drink from my saucer because my cup overfloweth. That's a great way to put it. Right? Psalm 23 says my cup overflows. God blesses us so much. We don't even have to drink out of the cup. We can just lick up what's on the plate that's flowing over from the cup. That's a great way to put it. Let's move on then. So open up your Bible. We're in Philippians chapter 2. And we're to the top of the second page on your study sheet. And just remember, in the big picture, Philippians is talking about how we can rejoice in the Lord always. So as we go through the book, We'll just see example after example of how Christians can find joy from God's blessings to us. I'll read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now in the Bible, whenever we think about joy or love or the things that, that we want to have as Christians, the Bible always bases those in Jesus. Jesus is the source of all of that. And so these verses start with four things that give us joy from Jesus. And there's four statements that start with the word if. Do you notice that in verses 1 and 2? If, 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 if. And now when you see those ifs, it's not if as if, well, we don't know if this is going to happen. It's an if as in, this has happened. And if you see this, then recognize what it means. Okay, I have those put out for you on your study sheet. So encouragement from being united with Christ, comfort from His love, common sharing in the Spirit, tenderness and compassion. According to Paul, these are all things that help us to have joy in our lives as Christians. What I want us to do is this. Paul invites us to think about Jesus, identify a time in Jesus' ministry when we see each of these things. So the first statement was, encouragement from being united with Christ. And that phrase encouragement in, in the Bible, it's, it's the word that means to walk side by side. Can you think of examples in the Bible where Jesus gave encouragement by walking side by side with people through life? Excellent. So you think about Jesus calling his disciples. And what's he saying? He's saying, I want to I wanna walk through life with you. I want you to be right by your side. Do you think that encouraged Peter to have Jesus say that to him? 
course it did. Kathy? When he was walking with an unbroken mask. Excellent. Just recently in church, we heard that story about Jesus on Easter walking with two men on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus was little, literally walking side by side with them. And remember, they didn't recognize Jesus. And then they did, and then he disappeared. And they said, were not our hearts burning within us as we walked with Jesus? You think this encouragement that comes from Jesus walking with us. Get it? What about when, with Mary and when they were going to the tomb and meeting? Good. Yeah, so the women on Easter morning or Mary Magdalene specifically that Jesus is why crying and he takes her tears away. Okay, this is one of the things that gives us joy. Jesus walks with us. That gives us encouragement. That gives us joy. Name? When the disciples were hiding after and Jesus after his resurrection came and said, Good. So on Easter night, the disciples were hiding with the doors locked, and Jesus showed up and he said, Peace be with you. All right, how about the second one? So comfort from his love. It's like speaking to someone as a friend. Can you think of examples in the Bible where Jesus gave someone comfort <clears throat> through his love? What's that? Excellent, Mary and Martha and Lazarus' death. That's a great example. So these two sisters are mourning the death of their brother. And Jesus shows up, and to Martha, he gives the promise, I am the resurrection and the life. That comforted her. To Mary, he doesn't say anything. He just cries. And so Jesus wept together with her. Right? Comfort from his love. Karen? Lady at the well. Good, there's that woman at the well. Who had lived a really sinful lifestyle. And especially in marriage. She had five husbands and was living with someone who wasn't her husband. And Jesus didn't send her away. And he talked about how you can have living water. I'll give you living water. Good, we get comfort from Jesus' love. For example, can it? What about the one that they Yeah, Jairus, Jairus. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of Jairus. That was a daughter. Jairus' daughter died. And Jesus said, oh, she's, she's just sleeping. And then he went and he raised her from the dead. Well, I think of Mary Magdalene when he said, he's like, let you go have saints back. Yeah. So there's that woman caught in adultery. And they want to stone her to death. And Jesus says, Go now and leave your life of sin. Forgave her. Okay, so we're thinking, how can we have joy when we get encouragement from Jesus walking side by side with us? We get comfort from Jesus' love. There's two more. Common sharing in the Spirit. Can you think of times when Jesus highlights that we have this oneness as a family? That we're sharing in God's blessings together. Monday, Thursday. What happened on Monday, Thursday? The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Right? You think about sharing together of God's blessings. Right? This is my body. This is my blood given for you. That gives us joy. Baptism. baptism. So baptism, the Holy Spirit. This was mentioned here, right? Sharing in the Spirit. Comes and lives in our hearts. Jesus said, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. That's how we get united together. I think even uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't go alone. He took Peter, James, and John. And what did he ask them to do? Yeah, he said, Watch and pray with me. Right? And so Jesus invited his disciples to, to encourage him. Of course, what did the disciples do? They fell asleep. They didn't do a very good job. Okay, but this oneness that we have in the Spirit. Right, on with the last one. Tenderness and compassion. Expressions of sympathy. Uh, what was that? Good. Jesus healed people. And so people brought their sick to Jesus. And he didn't say, you. He, he healed them. Good. Other examples that we haven't mentioned already? 
How about when the mothers were bringing their children to Jesus and the disciples shooed them away and Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Right? There's this tenderness and compassion in our Savior. Okay, and so as Paul talks about our lives as Christians, he talks about this Christian joy, like the Bible always does, he bases it on Jesus. Just look at what Jesus does for all of us. He gives us encouragement. He unites us to his spirit. He comforts us with his love. Right? This is what Jesus does for us. This is what leads us to have joy. Sleep on the cross. There was some tenderness and compassion. It's pretty hard to be tender and compassionate when you're in pain. Right? But Jesus was. Right? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Or comforting Mary and Martha after Lazarus died. Yeah, so comforting Mary and Martha. Right? This, this is where our, our joy is based on. Okay, so having said all of this, Paul says that there's something that would make his joy complete. If you look at verse 2. Right? If we really have our lives founded on all these things he gives to us, then, then what, what do we want to do? Be like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. He says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And so Paul says, if you really recognize and appreciate all these blessings from Jesus, then... Let this flow over into your relationships with each other. Okay, God wants Christians to be like-minded, having love for one another, being one in spirit and of one mind. Are all Christian churches like that? Why not? We're well, sinners, right? But this is where when we go back to Jesus, this is our goal. We want in our church people to say, I feel like we're one. I feel like we're family. I feel like people love and care about me. Right? This is, this is our goal. Paul mentioned some things that are indicators that we're not actually listening to what Jesus says. If you look at verses 3 and 4, what are three indicators that we're not taking to heart Christ's encouragement? Selfish ambition. All right, write that one down. Vain conceit. And what's the third thing? Looking to your own interests. Looking to your own interests. Okay, now we don't like to think about bad things, but let's take a moment just to think about these three things. Because Paul points them out as among Christians... These are really dangerous things that show we're not, we're not basing our joy on Jesus. So first it says selfish ambition. What might selfish ambition look like in a Christian church? So it could be being out for the money. Maybe you think especially about the pastor. If the pastor is all for the money, selfish ambition, or maybe all for the praise or the glory or the good reputation, Okay, then, then that's somebody who isn't finding their joy in Jesus. This is a dangerous thing, selfish ambition. Where might you see selfish ambition among you, the church members? I don't think you're here for the money, any of you, that I know of. But, yeah, there, there's always this, I, I want to look good in front of other people. And you know, if I go to church, that kind of makes me look good. Right? And if at church, I can show that I'm better than some of the other people at church, well, then I feel even better about myself. Right? Selfish ambition. You can see how our minds work and our sinful natures work. Right? This is an indicator that we're not, we're not basing our lives on Christ. How about selfish ambition being, every time something happens, I need to get my way. And if there's a decision about anything, well, not only should people hear my opinion, but they should do it. Every time. 
right? This is how the church is run. This is how it should go. And if people don't do what I think, then wow, that's so foolish, and people don't recognize how how wise I am. And, and you can imagine selfish ambition. It, it lives inside each one of us, and it takes Jesus and the Holy Spirit to, to beat that down, right? My life as a Christian is not about selfish ambition. How about vain conceit? So when you're vain, what does that mean? You, you, you. And when you're conceited, it's like you're focused in on yourself all the time. Okay? Maybe it's not too much different than selfish ambition, but this, this idea of my ideas are always the best. And my thoughts are always the best. And to be at church thinking about me. When, when we're at church, who are we called to think about? Jesus. And then after Jesus, whom else are we called to think about? Others. Okay, so if I'm at church thinking, well, what, what are they going to do for me today? Okay, I, I bet this has happened. Right? Is there a Sunday you've gone home and said, nobody talked to me today? All right? Maybe that's true, and if it is, it's not really a good thing, but that's not the right focus for you to have. Right? It's not, nobody encouraged me, what could my focus be? <coughs> Whom did I encourage today? Whom did I encourage? Whom did I ask how they're doing? Whom did I build up with God's Word? All right, so not vain conceit, but this attitude, how can I be an encourager of others? And then the last indicator that things aren't going well is looking to your own interests. Okay, and obviously these all go together. But when we gather together as Christians, the question we're asking is, what's, what's best for the body of Christ? What's best for Christians? Okay, now, I think most of you have been around churches long enough that you've been through some disputes and some arguments and probably some conflict in churches. And if ever that happens, how much of that is based on these three things? Selfish ambition or vain conceit or looking to my own interests. And this is where Jesus calls us away from all that. Okay, look for encouragement in Jesus and comfort from his love and power from his spirit. And when you find all these things, don't live for your own interests, but for the interests of others. Right? So what's the solution when we see these sinful attitudes in ourselves? Pray. Pray. That's a good thing. Humility. Yeah, you're not you're not saying the right answer. Jesus. Jesus! The right answer is you can always try to think of these really thoughtful things. You realize I'm not that thoughtful of a person, right? The answer is Jesus. Okay, and so notice what Paul does. You know, he, he builds us up with Christ and says, well, watch out for these things and don't look to your own interests. And then Paul knows that as Christians are hearing this letter, they're thinking, oh, this is really hard. And so he gives us one of the, the clearest sections in the Bible about Jesus. So if you need even more encouragement from Jesus, then listen to this. Let's, I'll read verses 5 to 11. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These are some really powerful verses about Jesus. I bet in your Bible, it's kind of indented differently. Like it's not as paragraphs, right? It's more like little lines and stuff. 
Do you remember what that means? It's poetry. And so this is our Bible. Of course, you know, the paragraphs, that all comes from the Bible translators. But they're indicating this section is written differently. It's not just in paragraphs. It's like, the, it's like a, an old poem describing Jesus. And the fancy words that Christians use for this poem are these. This is verses about the humiliation and the exaltation of Jesus. Have you heard those words before? Jesus' humiliation and Jesus' exaltation? Okay, now we have to understand these. When we hear the word humiliation, we think of somebody being ashamed, like they're humiliated. It's not what it means. It means humbling yourself. And exaltation to exalt someone means to raise them up. Does this make sense? So these are verses that are describing Jesus humbling himself and Jesus being raised up. So when I read this section, it's helpful for me to think of it like a stairway. A stairway that goes way down and then it goes way up. So this side of the stairway, going down, what would we call that? Humiliation. Humiliation. Jesus, humiliation. This side of the stairway going up? Exaltation. Exaltation. And Jesus did both. He was humbled and he was exalted as our Savior. All right? Now, I didn't, I didn't put like four steps because there's four specific things. But I think we could come up with four things. Just looking at those first verses, six to eight. What are kind of the stages in Jesus humbling himself? Where did he start? Way up here. Who is Jesus? God. It says in very nature God. This is where Jesus, he's way up here. It says in very nature God. If you have the very nature of God, who are you? God. Okay, this is one of the places in the Bible you could go when people today say, oh, Jesus isn't God. He's kind of, he's important, he's a good prophet. He isn't really God. Actually, the Bible says he's in very nature God. He's God himself. But Jesus humbled himself. What's the first thing that he did? It says, even before that, he said, I'm not going to use my position as God for me. Right? Different translations translate the phrase a little differently. Mine says, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. And so Jesus is up here. He is completely true God. And yet he said, you know what? I'm not going to use that for me. Okay? Just that. That's humbling himself. Right? We were just told, whose interest should we look out for? Not mine, but others. Jesus said the same thing. Okay, so he said, I'm not going to use all my power as God for me. I'm going to use it for others. Then what did he do? He became a human being. Okay, now we're, we're human beings. And we think that's pretty cool, right? And so we think to ourselves, well, being a human being, that's a pretty good thing. Except if you compare God with human beings, like how would you compare him? Can you kind of use your hands? Like, where's God? Up here, and where are people? Like, in the center of the earth, right? Like, whoa, ways away. And Jesus said, you know what? Instead of just being God, I'm going to become a human being. Okay? He humbled himself. But Jesus didn't stop there. You might expect Jesus to say, well, I'll become a human being, but I'll, I'm going to be you know, like a king. I'm going to be, you know, kind of on top. How far did Jesus humble himself? He even, he made himself nothing. Yeah, we could add another step in here. He made himself nothing. And what was the ultimate sign of how far Jesus went down? To be crucified. To death on a cross. And so even among all human beings, where did Jesus put himself? At the very bottom. At the very bottom. Isn't this amazing to think about? Okay, and here in Oklahoma, we have the, the death penalty. I think there's a schedule of once a month, there's a 
prisoner who's scheduled to be executed. And, okay, would you want to be that person? No. No. You wouldn't. And here Jesus voluntarily said, I'm going to be that person. Okay, and in Jesus' day, they didn't execute someone just with a, an injection or something meant to go pretty quickly. Crucifixion was purposefully created to be the most painful and longest way for someone to die. And Jesus says, I'll do that. Okay, he put himself on the bottom. And so, when the Bible tells us, don't look to your own interests, but to the interests of others like Jesus did, this is what that means, right? It means being willing to, to set aside even the things that you have a right to claim and to put yourself at the bottom of service to others. But did Jesus stay there? So he's still dying on the cross to this day. No. <laughs> That's right. The word that we use is God exalted him. He was exalted, so we got to do the other side. Right? Sometimes we Christians can make it seem, well, Jesus, he's, he's dying on the cross. He's still dying on the cross. He did. He died on the cross. But now where is Jesus? What are the steps going the other direction? It says God exalted him to the highest place. So he's not on the cross or in the tomb. He got raised from the dead and he put at the highest place. Okay, what, the, what else? Not just is Jesus at the highest place. He has the highest name. Alright? So, just think of the, the name of Jesus. That's meant to be the highest, most special name anywhere. Ever said by anyone. Okay, and just this is a little bit on the side, but there, there's a commandment about this. Do you know which commandment it is? The second commandment? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Why is that? Where is God's name supposed to be? The highest name. Okay, and just be aware of this for yourself. You know, it is so common to say, oh my God. To say, oh Jesus Christ. Right? Or we have different variations of those. Just remember... Jesus' name is meant to be the highest thing. You can use the name Jesus. It's not that you can't say Jesus, but use it for good things, to praise. All right, so he's, he's exalted. He's given the highest place. He's given the name above every name. And it really goes a long ways. What does is, what is the end of, of this little poem say? Every single person in heaven and on earth is going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single person is going to ultimately say, Jesus is Lord. And maybe we, we hear that and we say, well, when's that going to happen? On Judgment Day. How should we interpret under the earth? Yeah, good question. So it says, every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. So the, the point that's being made is, whether somebody believes in Jesus or not, whether someone goes to heaven or hell or not, every person is going to acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord. So even the people in hell are going to have to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Well, it's even in Scripture because the demons recognize Even the devil and his demons, they hate God. They don't believe in Him. But the devil knows that Jesus is way above him. The devil knows that Jesus is Lord. This is our, the promise of the Bible. And this is, this is good for us Christians to know. If it seems like in our world today, less and less people are honoring Jesus, you can know one day they all will. Not all out of faith. But one day, everyone is going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Good question. In heaven, on earth, under the earth. One day everybody's going to get it. Any questions about that, that staircase idea? This is one way to think about Jesus' work of saving us. He humbled himself, but don't stop there. God exalted him. 
This is what Jesus did for us. If you flip over the, the pages, your study sheet page, the third page, I have the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is this early confession of faith that Christians wrote not long after the time of Jesus. Just notice how the Apostles' Creed really echoes this. It echoes this going down and going up. This being humble to die for us and rising to save us. Okay, let's just read together the words of the Apostles' Creed. And as we're reading, with your pen or pencil, try to draw a line where it switches. You understand what I'm asking? Okay, so we're going to hear about the things Jesus did to humble himself. And then try to draw a line where it switches and now Jesus is being exalted. Okay, let's read the words together. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Okay, do you, do you see this idea what I'm talking about? How the Apostles' Creed too, it describes Jesus going down and dying for us, and then Jesus being exalted again. Okay, the first words, you know, this is where Jesus starts. He's the only Son of God. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit. But he suffered was crucified, died, buried. It's like we're walking down that. Look at what Jesus did for us. And then where does it switch? Yeah, so this is where we have this phrase right in the middle. Jesus descended into hell. And this is probably in the Apostles' Creed, the hardest line for us to understand. And maybe if you were to write the Apostles' Creed today, you'd say, I don't know if I'd write in there to descend into hell. It's only mentioned in one place in the Bible, one of the letters of Peter. What did Jesus descend into hell to do? Jesus Christ's victory. Yeah, to declare his victory. And so we're told that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. And he didn't preach to them a second chance or, oh, hey, it's okay. He went to hell to proclaim, I won. You demon and devils, you people who didn't believe in me, you need to know that I won. It goes back to even the knees under the earth are going to have to acknowledge Jesus' victory. Okay, so when you say the Apostles' Creed at church, think about this in your mind. This is what Jesus did. He went down. But now... This is Jesus being exalted. He sent into hell to proclaim his victory. He rose from the dead. He sent into heaven. He's seated at the highest place, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He's going to come back to judge the living and the dead, and everyone is going to know that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Do you have any questions about that? Karen? Just explain to me. Uh -huh. His only son. Why is it his capitalized? Excellent question. So he, up here in the top phrase. Times. So there there's been a there's been kind of a debate in English. Should we capitalize pronouns that refer to God? Understand that? So like he or his or should we capitalize those words? So what's important to note is that in Hebrew and Greek, in which the Bible was written. There's no capital letters. And so this is not something that we go back to, well, in the original Bible, did they capitalize these words or not? Well, there's no, there were no capital letters. Hebrew has no lower or uppercase, it just has letters. You think that'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? Maybe not, it's not quite as specific. But the, and so it's, it's not a debate that has any basis in the Bible. So in the Bible, there's no point where you have to capitalize. And so the way that English works is today in English, what's usually common is that we capitalize any name for God. So any name or title referring to God is capitalized. Like, 
Jesus Christ, Son, Lord, Holy Spirit, or Father, God the Father, any word that's actually referring to God, we capitalize. But, usually in English today, we don't capitalize the pronouns for God. So his or he. But you personally, you can do whatever you want to do. And so if you want to capitalize, you know, every single word anywhere that refers to God, you go right ahead. That'd be great. But so that's why when we have a title for Jesus, it's going to be capitalized. But if we just have the word his for Jesus or for God, it's not going to be capitalized. Does that make sense? Excellent question. Anyone? Anyway. My question is, he descended into hell. Why did they not, not add to declare his victory? I understand what that is and what that means. Right. But every time I say that, and there are visitors in church, mm -hmm. I think, do they really understand what we're saying? Yeah. So Nada said, why didn't the writers of the Apostles' Creed add a little explanation here? He descended into hell to proclaim his victory. And you will have to take it up with the Christians of the second century when you get to heaven. <laughs> Okay, and so what they say is true. Well, obviously, the goal of the Apostles' Creed is to be as concise as possible. Okay, I mean, you think, suffered, crucified, died, buried. We could say a whole lot more about all of those things. So, the goal of a, a little confession of faith is to be as short as possible. They certainly could have put more explanation in. That's where we need to study the Bible. Know what that is for ourselves. Good questions. Okay, before we move on from this, if you look at your study sheet, um, we're on page three. We read the words of the Apostles' Creed. We, did, we talked about which words describe Jesus' humiliation, which words describe Jesus' exaltation. There's one more little section there, right in the middle of the page. It says, a Christian's joy comes from Jesus. What joy comes from Jesus' humiliation? What joy comes from Jesus suffering, crucified, died, buried. Knowing that he did it for us. Go a little further than that. What does that mean for me? My, my sins are taken away. Jesus did this to pay for all of my sins. And so when I feel guilty for my sins, what can I remember? Jesus took it away. That guilty feeling means somebody should be punished for this. But the message of the Bible, Jesus already was punished for that. For that. Jesus took that away. David? This is the only way it could happen. Yeah, this is the only way it could happen. God carried out his plan. And maybe one other joy from watching Jesus suffering and death is to say, he loves me that much. Jesus loves you that much. Right? And I don't know, maybe for some of us, there's been somebody else in our lives that's actually died for us. Well, it's a pretty rare thing. Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. That brings us joy. What joy comes from Jesus' exaltation? All the rest of this, rising and ascending and sitting at God's, at God's throne. What joy does that bring us? Guarantee of heaven. We're going to hear in church today, Jesus has prepared a place for you in heaven. That's good. Yeah. That the Father accepted his sacrifice. That God, the Father, accepted Jesus' sacrifice. Our sins really are paid for. It's all taken care of. If Jesus is at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Who is it who's controlling the whole world? Jesus is. How does that bring me joy? Whatever happens, whatever happens, yeah. Jesus is going to work this out for the good of his people. Okay, and so on both sides, there's reasons for joy. Joy in seeing Jesus suffer and die for me, and joy in knowing that Jesus is at the right hand of God. Yeah? I always think about Jesus as being man, and now he's God. He still has all that knowledge of being man. Yeah. He knows what we Excellent. So Jesus, he's God and he's a man at the same time. So he has all this perfection and power and righteousness, but he also, he knows exactly what it's like to be a human being. And the 
Bible makes a big point of that, especially in the book of Hebrews. It talks about Jesus knows what it's like to be one of us. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to, to face death. He can relate to all those things. All of it. You know, <clears throat> if the Pharisees and scribes and all, most of Israel went, went along with the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, mm -hmm. and then he went, I think God would have had to find a different plan other than crucifixion because they wanted to crucify him. Mm -hmm. And so he would have came up with a different plan and we would have never known about this plan. That's just the way it is. I mean, he, he offered it to everyone and then most turned it down. So he had so this. Yeah. And so just to look back and to see how God's plan has played itself out in history, God's behind it. Absolutely. Okay, we've got a little more ways to go. We're back in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2. Next I'll read 12 to 18. So after hearing all this about Jesus, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. In this section, we have maybe the most confusing verse in the book of Philippians. It's not really confusing, but we need to talk about it. Right? <clears throat> Let me read again, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friend, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? What does it sound like it's said? You've got to save yourself. You've got to work out your salvation. Okay, and this is where we need to read both verses together. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. If you look on your study sheet, I have, it says there we need verse 13 to understand verse 12. With the help of verse 13, what is verse 12 not saying? Yeah, that we can earn our way to heaven. Verse 13 is telling us it's not saying that you can earn your way to heaven because who is it who's doing the work? God is. Okay, so verse 12 has been misused by groups of Christians who emphasize you have to save yourself. They'll say, oh, you, you think you're saved by faith in Jesus? No. We get what this says. You have to work out your salvation. You're not saved by faith in Jesus. You're saved by the good works that you do. But now you can know how you can respond. How could you respond? Read the next verse. Yeah, absolutely. It says, work out your salvation. But who is it who's doing the work? It's God. This is God. God's the one who works through us, right? We're not saved by me doing all this stuff. We're saved by God, okay? So what does verse 12 actually mean when we use verse 13 with it? So God wants us to serve the Lord. God wants us to take our salvation seriously, right? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Whenever you face something with fear and trembling, that means that you're taking it seriously, right? Eternal salvation is a serious thing. God wants us to be what we focus our lives on, right? But 
All that being said, whom is our trust and confidence placed in? It's placed in God. This is why we need God. We need God the Holy Spirit to work faith in our hearts. And we need God the Holy Spirit to work in our lives the good fruit that God wants to see in, in, in his people. Okay? We need, we need God to work in us to carry out his purpose. Does that make sense? Understand what that said? Okay, you know one of the biggest criticisms of Lutherans is that, well, you Lutherans, you're all about, you're just saved by faith, and you can live however you want to live. Is that really what the Bible teaches? No. Is that really what the Lutheran Church teaches? No. No. What we teach is the Bible's message, you're saved by the grace of God, and it's that grace of God that when we see our salvation leads us to live for Jesus. Okay, and so we want to live lives that nobody else can, oh, you're a Lutheran, you, you think you're saved by faith, but you don't care about how you live. Of course we care about how we live. We just understand that I don't deserve any credit for whatever good is happening in my life. It's all, <coughs> it's all by the grace of God. Yeah, right? I, uh, yeah. I uh, at work one time, when I was working, uh, one guy says, oh, we got to join your church to be saved. I said, well, no, but you got to be saved by grace. You know, faith, as it says, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Excellent. So Terry said he's had a co-worker say, oh, I've got to join your church if I want to be saved. And Terry had the good answer of saying, no, you don't have to join necessarily our church, but you do have to believe in Jesus. Yeah. By grace, we've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Ephesians 2, verse 8. And so, sure, we want to be careful not to say ours is the only church that you can be a part of to go to heaven. But at the same time, we need to say, but you do need to have faith in Jesus. That's what our sermon's about today. I don't want to give away what the sermon's about, so we're going to stop there. Right? But there is one way to heaven. It's through Jesus. Right? If, if we keep going through these verses, if you look at verse, verse 14, the next question on your study sheet is, I have the joy we get from Jesus is meant to impact our lives. A Christian is to live with, without... What does verse 14 say? Okay. Grumbling or arguing? Oh. Do you ever grumble or argue? There it is. <laughs> What's a grumble? <laughs> he argues with me all the time. Damn. This is another reminder. Just like earlier we heard about the selfish ambition and vain conceit and looking to our own interests. This is another reminder. If my life is full of grumbling and complaining and arguing, what is that a sign of? <laughs> I live in Washington, D.C. That's what the sign It's a sign of I'm not basing my joy on Jesus. Right? Okay, do Jesus' blessings to me ever change? Like, are there some days I can be thankful for Jesus, and other days not so much? No, whenever I'm grumbling and complaining, it's because my focus isn't on Jesus. Right? It's on me, or it's on the stuff I want, or on something else. And just remember this, this. This joy in Jesus is meant to impact our lives. When you catch yourself complaining about something, really catch yourself. Right? Why, why is this thing so important that I'm letting it cloud God's blessings to me? Why is this thing so important that I'm letting my heart get all worked up about it when I have this joy in Jesus? Right? If you look at the bottom, I think I've got it up here on the screen, a Christian's joy is not at all dependent on blank, but entirely on blank. What is our joy... Not dependent on. Okay, you could put ourselves. I have a better answer. That's a good one. It's a better answer. It's not dependent on our outward circumstances. It's a big blank. Didn't I put a big blank in there? It's another big blank. Outward circumstances. Roughly. We go 
So my joy is not based on my outward circumstances, but it's based entirely on Jesus. Okay, now that's a pretty simple phrase. My joy is not based on my outward circumstances. It's based entirely on Jesus. Why is that so hard to believe? Because we're sinners. And don't you, if you think about your life, isn't our joy so often dependent on how well the outward circumstances in our lives are going? Okay, if it's... If it's sunny outside and about 77 degrees, and we go outside, and what do we say? This is a beautiful day. This is a beautiful day. But then the next day it's sunny and it's 87 degrees. I walk outside and laugh. And we go outside and we say, Oh, it's too hot and it's humid today. And what is our joy based on? The air conditioning. Or our outward circumstances, right? And that's just that's a pretty simple example. But if our joy is based on the weather, we're going to be constantly going up or down. Okay. I figure if the rain doesn't hit me on the first job, I'll miss the ball. That's right. If we could think of all sorts of examples of this, right? When your when your favorite sports team wins the championship, how do you feel? That's a good one. Great. And when your favorite sports team is really bad, how do you feel? You crawl. And what are we doing? We're making our joy based on outward circumstances. Right? And this, this isn't a good thing. Right? Or how about maybe more seriously, if, if you're getting along with the people whom you love, how do you feel? Good. But all the other times, when you have this conflict and this sense of not knowing with people whom you love, how do you feel? You feel awful. And my joy can't be based on my outward circumstances. Those are going to change every single day. My joy is based on Jesus. So I had a little test of this. And this last week I was... I went to a pastor's conference Monday and Tuesday, and it was at Camp Shiloh, which is our Wells Lutheran camp in the north side of Texas, and I'm driving, so I'm on the Indian Creek Turnpike, which is just the best road, because you can go fast, and you don't have to stop anywhere for anything, and there's no cars, there's no towns, there's just completely nothing, and so you can just kind of drive, right? And it was a beautiful day, and it was sunny, and so I was driving, and I actually was thinking kind of about this Bible study, and just, Jesus, help me to have joy no matter what happens and you know when I think about that I get peace in my heart and I bet you do too when you think about Jesus and what he gives you and I got peace in my heart and right when I was feeling all this peace in my heart suddenly I hit a bird oh, no. but not like one of those it was one of those big turkey vultures that was it was on the side of the road eating something and I never you never think about it right and I'm driving by and it flies right in, it was purposefully it was like a suicide bomber. Like this was gonna, here's a car driving. I'm gonna get it. And, and it smashed the front headlight and broke it, and it was a rental car. And so this is exactly, and I was thinking to myself, I think God must have been doing this, right? Because I'm driving thinking, oh, I have all this peace in my heart, and, and it's great when the sun's shining and there's no problems. And then, now I've got to deal with this. And do I still have peace in my heart? No. Nope. Nope. For a, the next hour or so, as I was driving, I did not have peace in my heart. Right? And it's, it's so easy for this to go. And so, thankfully, our church insurance covers rental cars. And so, our, we, as a church, we have, we have pretty robust insurance for all the things that could happen. And one of the things it covers is driving a rental car. And so... And turkey vultures. I don't, I don't know if it specifically says turkey vulture in them. But if you want, yeah, it might be a little late now. You could drive down there and find a dead vulture on the side of the road. And it's all yours if you want to claim it. Yeah, but that, just for me personally, was an example of how, oh yeah, I have, I have such peace right now. And it's not, it's not necessarily because of God's blessings. It's because everything's going good. That's, that's true. They just, I don't know. They, 
finished the deer and went on right to that other vulture that was sitting on the side of the road now. Okay, but that's just an example of, that's how quickly, right? If our peace is based on, well, as long as everything's going good, it can change just like that. Okay, but it's not based on our outward circumstances, it's based on Jesus. Let's finish this chapter. So we've got 12 more verses to read. We'll go through these pretty quickly. So, chapter 2, verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as the son of his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give him. So we just talked about how when we see Christ's service to us, that leads us to serve others. And Paul points to two great examples of this. And not himself, he points to two other people. What two people were of great service to Paul? I just wanted to hear you say that name. Yeah. Timothy and Epaphroditus. And so Paul gives examples of, here are two people whom Jesus is using to care for me. Okay, and do we sometimes get so conceited that we don't think we need anybody else? Okay, the Apostle Paul makes very clear in the Bible how he needed other Christians. He describes Timothy like a son to him. Timothy was a young pastor. There's books in the Bible written to him, First and Second Timothy. And Paul says, you know, just about everybody looks to their own interests, but not Timothy. He, he serves out of love for Christ. And then this man of Aphrodite, we know a little bit less about him. He's clearly a messenger. So I don't know if you know this, but in those days there was no email. And so people actually had to travel around to carry messages. Yeah, and they had to talk. And so Aphrodite had been sent from Philippi to Rome, where Paul was, and now Paul says, I'm going to send him back. But you got to know, he actually almost died. And not from persecution, he got sick. And almost died. And Paul just talks in such a glowing way of, these two men, they're, they're encouragement to me. These are people Jesus uses to serve me. And you think, this is, this is how a church is supposed to work. None of us is meant to be a Christian all on our own. All of us need each other. And so when you say your prayers, say a prayer of thanks to the fellow Christians who encourage you. And then, think of whom you can encourage. Okay? You're not going to be best friends with every person at church. That's not at all what we're saying. But what we're saying is, you're here to encourage other people. Whom can you be a Timothy or an Epaphroditus to? Okay, I think in a previous lesson, someone asked, how did these letters get places? We think that Paul sent Philippians with Epaphroditus. So he's talking about sending him back. And so he probably sent this letter along with him to bring back to those people. All right, before we finish, this is how we're ending every class. I can enjoy, rejoice, even when, even when, because, because, because. So just from what we talked about today, I can rejoice... Even when I persecute. I persecute. Good. Not, I mean, that's not good, but it's a good answer. I can rejoice even when I hit a turkey vulture with a rental car. <laughs> yes. Okay, maybe you want to be a little more generic. I can rejoice even when 
my outward circumstances aren't going the way I want them to. I can rejoice because what would be some specific things from our lesson today that give me a reason to rejoice? Wow, because Christ humiliated himself for me as my saint. Christ suffered and died for my sins. I can rejoice. I can rejoice because Christ was exalted and he rose from the dead and he's ruling everything for my good. I can rejoice because of that. I can rejoice because I have fellow Christians. Exactly. There's people, they're not named Timothy or Epaphroditus anymore, but there's people that Christ puts in my life to encourage me. That gives me a reason to rejoice. Thanks for being here today. We're going to have two more weeks on Philippians, one for each of the last two chapters. We'll find lots more reasons to find joy in Jesus. Let's go with a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, today in your word we hear what you did for us. You humbled yourself and you were exalted, and both of those bring us joy. Thank you, dear Jesus, for not looking to your own interests, but to looking to our interests, and even humbling yourself to death on a cross. Thank you for rising from the dead and being the one who rules everything for our good. Dear Jesus, help our joy not to come from our outward circumstances. Those always change. Help our joy to come from you. No matter what we're facing today, give us your spirit and give us your strength to find joy in your promises. Bless each one of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.